Absolutely. There's a lot of common sense in that. You kind of look at the average person's day. During the day, most people are probably in a job or working, so they can't be sitting there watching videos, but they could do their work and they could be listening to a podcast, listening to music. In the evening, they're home, they're relaxed, they're on their couch, they're in their bed. That's when they got the freedom to scroll, which is why on nearly every case that we have look at an audience, the best time to post videos is usually in the evening, sort of between 7 and 9 p.m. to be on there when their target audience is utilizing the platform. And welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew. And I'm your host, Brett Deister. And this week, we're going to be talking about content marketing, everything that marketers and PR pros need to know to help bring awareness, help sell products, just about everything you can think of needs to have content. Even though word of mouth is still king, content's basically below it. Basically, it's the, it's the best way of saying it. But this week, I have... Aaron with me, and he has a three-step system to create in 30 days just original video and content and just last 90 minutes a month, which is actually kind of good because I spend hours and hours dreading what am I going to do next, but he has created just about 15,000 personal followers across LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and... He's been, he's hosted on his own podcast, producing 60 episodes plus, but welcome to the show, Aaron. Brett, it's awesome to be here and connecting across different parts of the world. Yes, you are way across the pond, and I mean way like the other side of the world, Australia, right? Is that, is that right? Or is it New Zealand? That's right. So I always joke that we're in the future when I'm talking to someone yeah. that's open states or Canada. So there you go. It's true. Don't spoil it for me. I kind of want to be surprised what happens. <laughs> Anyways, the first question is, all my guests is, are you a coffee or a tea drinker? I thought it would be irresponsible to show up to the show without some coffee. And in Melbourne, the part of Australia where I'm from, we're notorious nationally for being coffee snobs. So I'm coffee through and through. And I start the first five minutes of my day with coffee. It's my number one ritual. Nice. And I gave a brief overview of your expertise. Can you give us a little bit more about what you do? So we have an agency that both my wife and I own. It's a content marketing agency. And we've got a system that helps businesses, brands, creators create 30 days of video and written content that's authentic, original, and on brand in just 90 minutes a month. We call it an extraction model. And it's been developed over being in the marketing game for a long, long time and just finding the path of least resistance for people to be able to create consistent content every month without all the moving parts, without coming up with all the new ideas themselves and without the time commitment that it takes most people to create consistent content. Gotcha. So let's get into it. Just like what specifically is this three-step program and how easy is it as well? Because I think people just don't want it to be so hard. Exactly. So I think the first part is where a lot of people find it challenging is the content ideas. And it takes longer to explain how to find the ideas than it takes to actually get the ideas. So there's free strategies that will give you content ideas on demand. For example, if you just go to the Google or YouTube search engine, you type in weight loss, it's going to give you suggested searches. They're content ideas that have been recommended to you by the platform. If you type in weight loss tips, it's going to give you another lot of suggested searches and you can keep doing that and go, okay, which one of those suggested searches can I add value to? So that's the fast free way to do it. Then there's some tools and the one that we a bullish on is called vidIQ. And what that does is not only just give you the ideas, but it tells you how many people are searching for it, what's the competition for that particular search, and give you hundreds of results. So if you type in content marketing, for example, into vidIQ, it's probably going to give me three, 400 results. I can go to the questions tab, see what questions people are searching for, and then just hand pick the content ideas from that list that I feel like I can add value to and I'm ready to go and no more problems coming out with new content ideas. So that's step number one in the process. Got you. And then 
I mean, the next question, could you could you also use like answer the public is another actual good one. Have you ever heard of that one where it kind of gives you a bigger rundown than the actual Google searches? Absolutely. There's a lot of tools and Google Trends is another example if you want to find trending topics in your niche. So there's probably 20 or 30 different tools where you can get content ideas on demand, but absolutely that's another great resource if people want to get fast ideas for their content strategy. And I mean, we have to ask the elephant in the room, but can you actually use AI? Because I mean, you cannot talk about AI for the past two years. It seems like everything has been about AI. So ha has your step, because it kind of seems like it with vidIQ, has it morphed with AI tools as well, just to get a little bit more, maybe more specific on your searches too? Yeah, any tools like that generally have AI built into them. That's how they're pulling all the data and information. But you've also got ChatGPT there where you can go, hey, can I have 100 content ideas for XYZ topic? And it'll spit them out for you. So we've got so many quick ways when you're feeling stuck or overwhelmed or I don't know what I'm going to talk about today just to get some inspiration and ideas quickly and then sort of handpick the ones that you feel resonate and are a good fit for your audience. And then what's if they do step one, but they're like, I really don't like these content ideas. Like, what's the next step back? Because it feels like it's like, yeah, we have all these content ideas. Yeah, I really don't want to do these content ideas. I'll, yeah, it's a good one because sometimes you're like, they're not of any value to my audience or I don't have an answer to that particular question. So we're big on having a hybrid approach. So the way step two works, and I'll lean into that because that'll help explain, is the recording process. So you've got your list of your content ideas from your research step, but then you also have a story component where you share a story from the last week or it could be any stage of your life. And you also have a freestyle section where you just talk. So the way it works is you've got someone else, just like we're doing right now on a recording platform. It could be Google Meet, it could be Zoom, it could be Teams. And the way that you get authentic, original content that doesn't feel scripted, it's not weird or forced is through the conversation process. So the person on the other side is just asking you the questions, tell me a story about something that happened with a client last week and you get great content from things that have happened in real time. So you, you could have yeah, a story that happened from your, your week driving to work or in the gym. So you're getting a nice spread of personalized content. And then you can start leaning into some of the questions that are on that list. And you might say, pass, I don't have an answer for that. Or, you know what, here's a tip for that. Or here's how you solve this problem. And just through the conversation process, it naturally comes out. And what you do have at the end is this recording of the uh, conversation. And that's where you lean into step three, which is the repurposing process in the extraction model. So what's for people at step two, but you, you, you talk about video content. A lot of people are really shying away from video just because there is a lot of time commitments for this. Also, you gotta understand lighting, you gotta understand background lighting, and you have to have good audio because you can have okay video, but if the audio is blown out, people will not listen to you. So what do you say to those people that are like, oh, that's a lot of like, that's a lot of, set up to do like what do you say to those people about just vi creating video content we say iphone so whatever whoever's doing answering the questions set up your iphone in portrait so it's in that vertical setting that'll get really good video quality make sure you're in a room or a space where you're happy with the lighting and number two a very simple lapel microphone you can get on amazon for 50 bucks that'll get your sound in check one that's bluetooth so you just clip it onto your shirt talking into your smartphone, that tends to deliver a very high quality video, very high sound quality. And uh, if you choose a, a room where the, the natural lighting's reasonably flattering for you, you'll tend to tick those boxes without going over the top with setup and costs and all those moving parts. And I mean, the editing part, it, it, is it easier to edit shorts? Because I mean, the editing part does kind of help you go viral or get more people to actually watch you because if you're rambling too much people go you're rambling too much i don't like this and then nobody listens to you exactly so the repurposing step is the editing part and there's a, many different ways you can go about it one is you have an editor so you can go to a platform like upwork and you can find someone in another country that can edit really high quality really efficiently inside your budget which you can set on that platform and they can go through and cut 
the clips or we say mining for the gold. So the 20, 40, 60 second grabs that are articulate, they're nice, they're edgy. So you've got the great content. And then of course, put the captions and the branding and all that on it. So it's engaging and it holds the viewer's attention. There's an AI tool that's called Opus Clip or opus.pro, I think is the URL. You can run the content or the, the recording through that tool and it'll spit out dozens of clips. It picks it intuitively so you don't have creative discretion over what it chooses but for someone that's on a budget that's just starting out that can be a really efficient place to get going and leveraging the ai tool and then for the written content we use rev.com so you just give them the video it'll transcribe the video for you and then you can just repurpose it into posts by taking the little bits of gold nuggets that are in there and again you can get someone like a va on upwork to do that you could handball it to chat GPT and see how it goes, uh, but you'd have to prompt it really well to get exactly what you want out of that process. Mm, well, how about the reverse? Well, let's say someone's a writer, but doesn't really like to do video or video editing. Could they do the reverse with AI? I, I'm not sure if it's quite up to snuff yet, but could the reverse happen for that one yet? Or are we still way far away from that? What I would say is if you don't like being on video, still do the voice recording. So, but don't use the video. So you just talk into a microphone for 20, 30 minutes, send the transcription off to a tool like rev.com and then you've sped up the process and you don't have to sit there typing out all those ideas, which could take a long time. You've just leveraged speaking, which is generally much faster for most people, plus getting that natural flow of conversation drawn out from within, which is generally pretty authentic. And then you're letting the tools uh, help speed up the process so you're not sitting there with writer's block and churning out hours and hours on the keyboard. Mm. And I mean, for those marketing PR pros that work for a company, since January is the month of layoffs and we've seen a bunch of layoffs, how do they convince them to use a budget? Even if it's a small budget, it seems like a lot of bosses are like, is this going to be worth it? How can they like convince their bosses to give a small amount of budget and be like, hey, hey, we're just wanting to experiment with this. We can just give this much away to actually do it. How do you convince them to do it? I think you've always got to keep in mind what the business wants and speak to that need. So a lot of people are just like, I need this budget. But if you can articulate to your boss, to your employer and go, hey, this is how it's going to benefit the business long term. It gives us a competitive advantage. It introduces the humans behind the brand, which should help with conversion. Uh, it it you know, gives us more search engine real estate and to show up in places where our target audience are. When you talk about the benefits that it'll give to the business rather than, hey, I need this money over here, it makes a lot more sense to a business owner. So you've always got to step back and go, if I was the business owner, what would pitch it to me and sort of put yourself in their shoes? And that's usually the way that you can get a business owner across the line with getting some budget for it. Uh, and would it really depend on the demographics too? Because I mean, for example, not a lot of older people, I mean, they're sl slowly getting onto TikTok, but not a lot of them are on TikTok. So a lot of them wouldn't actually watch shorts. They may have to do a square format for, well, you could do short format on LinkedIn, but they usually like square, but it will it depend on that. And it, is that the frame you should do it for business owners? Like, Hey, look, we were, we're a B2B company. Let's do 15 minute videos on LinkedIn. And then we could probably get something out of that too. Yeah. So my role is always primary platform and then a secondary platform. So whatever your primary platform is, that's the style of video you'll create that suits that platform. The secondary platform I always encourage people to have is YouTube just because of that search component and the fact that it's a 24 seven evergreen search engine. So if you're in B2B space and your clients are business owners and of course LinkedIn's you go to, if you're a visually aesthetic brand and it's for the younger generations and you might be looking at your TikToks and your Instagram. So you have your place that you curate deliberate content for and the style that suits that platform and then have that secondary one as a backup that'll help with search engine and people that are actively looking for solutions to problems through search. And then for 2024, I mean, we've we've seen Google go from <laughs> feed burner to Google podcast back to YouTube music. So what do you say to the YouTubers that I mean, the podcasters that always have to like switch between all that stuff for like video and stuff, because I'm splitting mine up. Let's say I'm splitting mine up into a podcast video and then a podcast for audio. So I get both of them. Is that like something they should do for their strategy wise for the YouTube music algorithm? Because I mean, you have two different formats and most 
podcast hosting sites don't do video format. They just do audio. I'm very bullish on doing the video component, particularly for podcasters, because it just gives you that extra asset. I think putting yourself in a container where you only do one format, it can be a way to easily get started. And that's great if it just gets you going. But I think once you're established and you've got a show up and running, you're leaving a lot on the table by omitting video. I think it gives you such a, an important reach being on a platform like YouTube where you have that face and that voice and you hit all the senses by someone being able to see you. And plus it also protects that content in another place. So it's almost like backed up in, in another uh, platform for you. So if something happened with another platform, you've always got that thing up your sleeve that the, the episodes are still there and live where people can get access to it. And I mean, do you agree with the stats? I read stats recently that said that in the morning and afternoon-ish, they only listen to audio, but at nighttime, that's when they actually, in the evening time, that's when they actually watch the video. Do you do you kind of agree with this stat? I mean, this was last year, but still, it's pretty relevant. Absolutely. There's a lot of common sense in that. You kind of look at the average person's day. During the day, most people are probably in a job or working, so they can't be sitting there watching videos, but they could do their work and they could be listening to a podcast, listening to music in the evening, they're home, they're relaxed, they're on their couch, they're in their bed. That's when they got the freedom to scroll, which is why on nearly every case that we've looked at an audience, the best time to post videos is usually in the evening, sort of between 7 and 9 p.m. to be on there when their target audience is utilizing the platform. And is this just for just the regular format or does this go for shorts as well? Absolutely. Well, shorts, the best performance time that I've seen is 4.45 p.m. Uh, and that's in any local area. So when people are finishing up for the day, so they might be commuting back. Anytime we post content there, we tend to get a little lift in performance. VidIQ, which gives me my feedback, tells me to post at 12 a.m., but anytime I post at 4.45 p.m. just before people wind up for the day, that's when I see the best performance. So that's just my own personal data. I'm sure there's conflicting information out there, but I'll share it from what I see with the content that we put out. And 4.45 p.m. seems to be the golden time for YouTube for us. And then, I mean, for the actual, like, data, should they do VidIQ? Should they do TubeBuddy? I mean, then... I'm pretty sure there's a plethora of other ones out there. And also, should they look at the stats as well from YouTube? Because YouTube is owned by Google, and they're all about stats. So should they look at all three of these, and should they invest a little bit into uh, TubeBuddy or VidIQ? I think it depends a little bit on where you're at in the journey. I think look at the tools and go, which one do I like? The data and the information that it gives me. A lot of them have trials, so you can get on there and, and do some groundwork and pull some data before you start paying for it. And they're not usually that expensive, like a few dollars, a couple of cups of coffee a month. So dive in and if you, for some reason, after 30 days, you weren't liking what it was giving you back, then you might go, okay, I don't need to keep paying for this subscription. But in terms of the stats, I think worrying about them early in the journey is a big mistake because you're going to get very discouraged. If you do 10 pieces of content, for example, one of them is going to be your best piece. One of them is going to be your worst piece out of those 10. And if you're looking at the views and the likes and the engagement when you don't have an audience, I think that's a big reason why so many people quit and go, it's just not worth it. But I'll, in the back of my mind, the mindset I have is at any point in time, I'm just looking for those one or two people that needed to hear this message. And that's all I'm thinking about with each piece of content. I'm not worried about a thousand people that I don't know. It's like, who's the one or two people that if I put this out, they're going to receive value from getting this message. And that mindset helps me not look at the stats and get discouraged early on. And then naturally, when you get bigger, you get an audience, the stats start to matter more because you get the feedback. Okay, what worked really well? What didn't work? What do we need to spend more time talking about in our content? When do we post that gets the best results? And you can start doubling down on what works and start eliminating what doesn't work in the future once you've got consistent with showing up and doing the content. And so when should you start really caring about the stats? So you said just don't really pay attention to it too much. I'm pretty sure we're all going to look at it and like kind of see where things are, but when should you start actually caring about it or start caring about it more? Because I think we all care about it a little bit. Of course, you're not going to not see it there. 
I think it's just that mindset's okay, I'm just going to build the habit and the muscle first. It's like you go for your first run and you haven't run for two years. You're going to not get very far. It's going to suck. It's going to be sweaty. It's going to hurt and you're going to want to quit. Content's a bit the same, but then you go for another run, another run in a month down the track, you're feeling a bit fresher, you're going a bit further. So the quality and the results improve as you go along. So for me personally, I look at building the habit first and foremost, and I'd usually give that 12 months. So I go, I just want to get consistent. So every week I know what my output looks like. Once I'm at 12 months, I've got the habit. So I don't need to worry about showing up and doing the work. I know that's there. So now I'm going to start taking the stats more seriously because I know I'm going to keep showing up. And that's when I'll start to use the data to tweak the approach that I'm using with the content and to focus on some more specific areas and move away from some ones that weren't working very well. Let's say people just starting out this editing thing. Like, is there any like specific tool uh, editing software you recommend? Like, maybe Audacity is a free software they can actually use. Like, CapCut is also free. Should they look at more of the free ones? Since I mean, limited budgets or everything, should they focus more on the gear side of it first and then the editing process? What do you What do you think about? I think efficiency is really helpful, and then budgeting is a personal thing. If you've got budget there, I'm always a big advocate of stay in your lane of genius as a creator, which is the content. And if you can get some tools or some resources or external support to give you your time back, then invest in that. That's certainly the way I look at it now. But if you're starting out, you don't have a budget, then those free tools and the ones you just mentioned are great. And it also helps you learn those tools, which can actually help you down the track, outsource it to someone else to go, hey, here's how you can do this for me. I'll pay you to, to do the editing on the background work and that now that I've got some budget there. So I think if you're on a budget, absolutely start with the tools, learn as you go. But if you do have capital to work with or money in the bank, protect your time because you can put it into much higher ROI generating activities that can bring in more money and naturally accelerate the path to your goals and grow your business much sooner. Now, what do you say to like new podcasters or new marketers like doing auto editing? Like for me, I could not listen to myself and it was like a painful thing to do to w listen to myself. Like I was like, I I'm better now, but it, but in the beginning, like six months, I was like, do I really have to do this? Yeah, it's funny because I'm exactly the same. If I listen back to this, I'm going to be pulling apart every piece of the conversation. And if I watched it back and edit it, I'll go over the top with editing because oh, I don't want that bit, I want that bit out. So I had to bite the bullet personally. And I've got Francois who edits my, my videos and he's great. And I just don't look at it, don't worry about it. I just get it up and uh, white gloves, a bit like if I, if I don't touch it, don't look at it, I'm not going to start you know, getting emotionally attached to what I've done and what I said. And then I'll just let now with where I'm at, the data give me the feedback on what's happening and go, okay, that was good or no one really responded to that. So we probably should go in a different direction. Now let's say you've done the 30 days. Do you just go back around and like do it, like do the loop over again and again? And let's say the first 30 days didn't go so well. How would how could would you tell people how to like change it if something didn't go so well? Would it be to do a better search? Because even with AI, you have to have like really good search queries or they won't give you the best actual like advice or best searches back. Yeah, so it's a cycle. So you come back, so you've always got fresh. So you might have some new stories that have happened in the last month that you can tell and share. So you've got that fresh information, some new content ideas might be trending. So you're always coming you, you might have updated your look and, and the way you're showing up and what's happening in your world. So that always means that you've got fresh, original, authentic content. You're always getting better at your craft. So you repeat that loop every 30 days. And if you look back at the last 30 and you go, not a lot happens, what I would do is actually do a bit of modeling. So I go into the platform that you focus on. I go, okay, who's kind of leading in this space? Who's a standout creator or business brand, depending on what you're utilizing your content strategy for go okay what are they doing what's unique about their content what style of content are they doing how are they delivering it when are they posting it what tags are they using you can kind of borrow their success they've kind of carved the path for you so i usually go do a little bit of due diligence if something hasn't worked to go well what is working for other people and can i borrow any of that to maybe lift the performance of my content in the next 30 days 
let's say like a trend quickly changes and you're in like the middle of your 30 days, how can you like pivot on that one? Is it, is it, are you continually searching for it? Are you continually looking at those Google alerts? Should you do that? Because I mean, trends change on a dime sometimes. You're like, oh, this is good. And you're like, nope, that's not good anymore. That's not good. Yeah, the, all the 30 days is your what I call your foundational content. So that's just to ensure that you've got your consistent content for the month ahead. But what you can do is have your Google alerts. So when a hot topic makes the headlines or is coming up in your industry, you can create content on the fly. So that's where you can do additional content that's super relevant at the right time rather than it being 30 days later and now the bus has moved on and no one's listening to that subject anymore. So the 30 days is there for your consistency and to make sure you have content every month and then to jump on trending and relevant topics. That's something that you do on the fly as you go for additional content throughout the month. And should you start off with just one platform to kind of get started and then eventually go off to other ones or should you just like <laughs> shotgun blast it out and hope one sticks? I, I made a mistake in this. I did the shotgun approach and I was trying to do all these platforms, but it's really hard to engage, build a community across multiple platforms. Plus if you're repurposing the same style of content it's a little bit different with each platform. So I'm very bullish on starting out. Keep it simple. Just go with your primary platform. So which platform has your target audience? What style of content are they most engaged with? And usually it's the platform that you enjoy and spend the most time on. So the answer is often obvious. Keep it simple there. Once you've got that muscle going, you can look at some secondary platforms. But I'm a big fan on focusing on one to get going and making it as simple as possible and m removing any complexity that, that could be sitting there. And what do you think the future holds for your 30 days plus content marketing? Because it's it's ever changing. First it was YouTube, 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 but then it was TikTok. Well, still now is TikTok. Maybe it's the metaverse. I'm still not convinced about the metaverse. Maybe it's AR. I mean, we have the Apple Vision Pros coming, I think in February. I think they finally announced it at CES. Like, where do you think all this content is going? And how can podcasters, marketers, and PR pros like pivot all this stuff because i mean a lot of podcasters they're, they're a one-man team like they have nobody else but themselves so how can they keep up with all that's going on i think one is paying attention just to seeing how the marketplace moves i think podcasting is one of those places where it'll always be there because people love connecting with humans, they love listening to someone else, especially if they've got a pre-existing relationship and you've built up an audience over time. People like that connection. So I think they'll be relatively safe. There's probably gonna be increases in efficiency in the way that you can produce and do things and enhance things. So I think that's where the technology comes in. Naturally, you know, augmented reality and all those things are going to come into play. But I think generally speaking, platforms where there's human connection are going to be very strong even more so when there's more artificial content out there because people want that connection they want to hear from other people we're a species that loves that we're a herd animal so i think there's always going to be a place for that so i don't think we need to get too worried yet of course people will love you playing around and exploring with all the artificial synthetic content but i think there's always a place for human content just because we're humans and what is your take on the Apple Podcasts new change where it's not, well, downloads are way down for podcasters because of the automatic downloads not really doing what they're doing anymore. They've changed it. And I've seen, I think just recently today through Pod News that a lot of them, a lot of big podcasters ink deals that may not actually hit their listener numbers. So what do you say about that? Because it could be good because we're getting more realistic numbers, but it's bad because it doesn't look so good. I think you always have to accept that platforms are going to change based on their audience and users. So to think that it's always going to be one way and something's always going to work forever is a little bit naive. We've seen just about every platform have to pivot and the ones that don't fall behind very quickly. So as a creator, I look at it as you've got to be a little bit, the word is intertemporal, which is a big word, but it's like you've got to be efficient now, the way it works now, but you also need to understand and protect for the future. 
So I think putting all your eggs in one basket and saying, hey, it's always going to be like this is, is a big risk. And you have to accept that platforms will evolve and prioritize based on their users because that's their customer base. And you may have to adapt and get flexible with the way that you do things in order to keep up with those changes. So I think change is inevitable and we just have to accept it and we have to keep evolving with it if we want to take advantage of how the platforms treat the creators moving forward. And it seems like having your own space, not just relying on social or, oops, or basically social or any of the other companies like from podcasting companies like Spotify and all that may not be the best way either because I, I realize this that podcasting for podcasters, we're fighting against our own podcasts and other platforms to be number one on our own thing. So is it good to actually have your own actual podcast? I mean, website for your podcast and everything else that doesn't rely on other companies and their changes? Well, you're at the mercy of any platform that you've just got your content on, aren't you? So having your own website with your own content is a really good way to hedge against that. For example, there've been people I've known that have built major audiences on their social media to have their account banned and taken down and all of a sudden that asset's gone. So that's the one reason why, one, I'm bullish on having a secondary platform after your primary platform. But number two, if you can house the content yourself on a place like a website or at least have it back up and stored somewhere. So if you were taken off a platform, you can get it somewhere else. I think that's just responsible. And it just gives you options and flexibility into the future when things inevitably do change. I'm pretty sure people are going to love this, but where can they find you for more? Maybe they're interested in more of what you do in your, your three-step process. Yeah. The best place to go is contentonly.au. That's an Australian website. We've got, we give away the system for free. So anyone can download the 30 days in 90 minutes content creation system. There's a video. It takes you through all the steps and depending on where you're at in your journey, it'll cater to that. So that's the easiest place to go further with the things that we've been talking about today. And we'll update that if the marketplace and the tools and the technology change, so you won't be stuck with a stagnant system that's outdated in 12 months or 24 months as well. Any final thoughts for listeners? I just think get on the field is really, really important. I think overthinking content creation, podcasting, whatever it is you want to do is what pauses and freezes a lot of people into inaction. I think get started, get going and be okay with just getting better as you go. So that's always my invitation. Stop putting it off. Stop thinking about it. Get on the field because being in the grandstand, all you can do is spectate the people that are playing on the field. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on content marketing and podcasting. Been great, brother. Really appreciated having this conversation with you. Yes, and thank you as always for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and all your favorite podcasting apps. Leave a five-star review. It really does help. And joining me next week is to talk to another great thought leader in the PR marketing space. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding that three-step process. Get to making that content. And see you next week. Later.